Let me start with a very well-known Christmas hymn. At least it's well-known to me. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the glory, an angel of the Lord came down and glory shone around. Now that's what happened. That's kind of a nice little verse that describes what uh, Scott read to us from Luke chapter 2. But let me ask you this. After that, after the shepherds watched their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, an angel of the Lord came down and glory shone around. What's the very first thing that the angel said? Unmute yourself and tell me if you know. I'm ready. Fear not. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Good job. You are right. Fear not or do not be afraid. But let's stick with fear not. And I want you to not be afraid that starting today, starting today, we're taking just a wee little vacation from the series Surprised by Grace in order to fit in this Advent series. Uh, we shall return, don't worry, we shall return to the delights of amazing, abounding, saving grace in January 2021. But for now, we are here in this Advent series and so our text for today, the second Sunday of Advent, shall be read to us by none other than Linus. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. You are absolutely right. Fear not. Fear not. The shepherds that night, they were out in the fields, and when the angel appeared, they were absolutely terrified can you blame them? I can't. I can't blame them. They acted as any one of us would have acted. And so it's no surprise that the very first words from the angels were, fear not. But you know what? Do you know what, my brothers and sisters? There is more to those two simple words than meets the eye. I think we have been missing something all these years. I think there's something that's embedded in these two words for the discerning to understand. I think this was more than just advice given by the angels to calm down the panicking shepherds, you know, where they say, fear not, you guys, you know, you're going to give yourselves a heart attack. Like, take a chill pill, will you? Just calm down, calm down. It was more than that. I think we have to dig deeper. I think we have to go deeper. And so we shall. Fear not was a super signal. Fear not was a mega shift. Fear not was a demarcation line marking the end of an era, the end of fear as we know it, and the beginning of a brand new era that God has come to dwell with man, that God has come and become incarnate, that Christ has come in the flesh. Fear not meant the times of fear are over, and the days of hope and peace and joy have arrived. Now, fear is one of the great many works of the devil that the Lord Jesus Christ came to destroy. Did you know that? 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And if there's one thing, if there's one thing that is so clearly devil's work, it's fear. Fear is devil's work. So fear not, you trembling shepherds. Fear not, you people living down through the ages of the last 2,000 years. And fear not, you Zoomers, on this second day of Advent, 2020. These words were intended for you and for me this very day. Fear not, fear not, and fear not. 
Let God no longer be the object of your fear and your dread. The days of standing off at a distance from God are no more. The word has become flesh. God has descended to the tabernacle of men. Isn't that beautiful? God has descended to the tabernacle of men. The gulf between God and man has disappeared. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. And so this is our Advent theme. This is what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about history in the making 2,000 years ago. We're talking about this great change in relationship between God and man that was ushered in that very night with two words, fear not. Now I know what you're thinking. Those of you who know the Bible, and those of you who understand the basics of Christian theology, and some of you understand a whole lot more than the basics of Christian theology, you're saying to yourself, yes, but isn't there a healthy fear of God that is absolutely necessary and essential and proper for us to have? I mean, doesn't the Bible say in four different places the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in two more times. Isn't it true that the thing our world is missing today is precisely this holy fear of the infinite, eternal, righteous God? Pastor, have you not preached yourself, woe to the man who does not possess a healthy fear of God? Haven't you said that yourself? I have. I have. And everything I just said there about the fear of the Lord is true. We need to keep that fear of the Lord, because that fear of the Lord that I've just been talking about for the last minute and a half, that's tantamount to respect. Have respect for God. Honor God. Show reverence towards God. Admire Him. Worship Him. Anything less than that kind of fear that's hardly in keeping for any child of God. But the fear that's being exterminated here by the angel's announcement on that first Christmas, that night divine, with angelic song and great glad tidings, is the fear that keeps us at a distance from God Almighty. The angels were addressing that fear that keeps us at a distance that morning. You know what? I remember the day that I first got excited about the theology of God. I remember the day. No, I don't remember the exact day. You know, the, the study of God, that's what theology is, the study of God. I don't remember the exact day that I got excited about it, but I do remember what got me excited. What stirred up my mind and stirred up my heart to understand more about God was when I heard about a pair of words. That These two words, they stand at opposite ends of the universe concerning the nature of God. And these two words are transcendence and imminence or intimacy. And what excited me so much was when it clicked in me that God is both. God is both transcendent and God is imminent or intimate. You see, that's no surprise to you. You look at this screen there, you see those two words, and you go, yes, God is transcendent. Yes, God is imminent and intimate. Christians understand that. But you know, those who lived prior to the fear not announcement of the angels while the shepherds watched their flocks by night. Before that announcement was made, the focus was exclusively on the transcendence of God. And it's well possible that that is your entire focus today as well, on the transcendence of God. Now, let me, let me just go with you down that path for a little bit this morning, okay? So come along, come along with me down that path. Have you pondered the transcendence of God before? In other words, is it possible 
to stare into the abyss of infinity and not get afraid? Can you, have you contemplated the eternal God, the self-existing eternal God, the self-existing eternal infinite God? Have you contemplated him Without being, fear, uh, without being filled with awe and then a looming sense of dread. See, I don't think it's possible to contemplate those things without being filled with fear and dread. Has it ever occurred to you, my friend, that an ant on the sidewalk, an aphid crawling around on a rosebud, a fly walking on the kitchen wall in your house. Those creatures are greater creatures in relation to the universe than you are in relation to God. Well, it's true. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is man? A piece of lint sits heavier on the scale than a mere mortal does compared with the infinite gravity of Almighty God. You see what's happening? You see what happens when you contemplate the transcendence of God? You begin to realize how tiny, how minuscule, how insignificant we are. And then to make matters worse, much, much worse, not only are we small, but we have somehow conjured up the insolence the cheekiness, the brazenness to offend this great God with our disobedience, with our breaking of his laws, even sometimes shaking our fist at heaven. I mean, have we lost our mind? What then is God to us but a rock of Gibraltar to crush us as flat as a pancake or Mariana's trench to swallow us up? The transcendence of God, it's almost too much to handle. The prophet wrote, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. You must admit that to think in those terms of transcendence, it does fill a man's heart with horror and dread and fear. It's no wonder that there does exist a certain fear in the hearts of men towards God. That really is the natural state of affairs. It's exactly what alienates man from his creator. It's just what we learned in the early lessons of Saved by Grace, that by nature we are enemies of God. We just are. By nature we're enemies of God. In our unredeemed mind, we look up at the transcendent God way out there, and then we look around at our world that's filled with sorrow and plague and bad news, and then we look back up to the transcendent God, and we conclude God's cruel. God is harsh. God is terrible. Who would ever want to love him? Who would ever want to follow him? He's so cold. He's so distant. He's so unfeeling. Surely to follow that God would only make us miserable. And that, my friends, is exactly the conviction of the majority of Canadians walking the streets today, lining up in the queues today. They think that to trust him, to be obedient to this God, to follow him, to serve him, that would be the height of of a wretched existence. No thanks. It must be misery to be God's friend, they think. To be God's enemy, well, now, to be God's enemy, at least now I've got a fighting chance to get some happiness out of this life. And so off they go, off to the bar, and then to another bar, and off they go from one scheme to the next scheme, off they go from one bed to the next bed, off they go from one party to the next party, off they go from one job to the next job, 
And more than anything else, off they go from one sorrow to the next sorrow. But you know what? With that kind of lopsided view of God, where all the eggs are in the transcendent basket, it kind of makes sense to act that way. All right. Enough of that. Let's return to the text and to the angelic announcement. Fear not. As of 12.01 a.m. on that silent night, holy night, on that night divine, it officially became a crime and misdemeanor, a holy dishonor to paint God with only one brush, the transcendent brush. Now the announcement comes. Fear not. God is not cold. God is not cruel. God is not harsh. God is not unforgiving. God is not heartless. God is not unkind. God is love. God is imminent. And God is intimate. Why? Why? What, what right do I have to say that? Do you want to know why? Here it is. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Well, sing hallelujah. Now thank we all our God, and we praise your glorious name. Because... Till God in human flesh I see, my thoughts no comfort find. The holy, just, and sacred three are terrors to my mind. But if Emmanuel's face appears, my hope, my joy begins. His name forbids my slavish fear. His grace removes my sins. Hear then my brothers and sisters. Here then is the remedy for fear. God with us. God made flesh. Born this day in the city of David is Christ the Lord. Fear not, you timid mortals. God has come down. God has taken humanity into union with himself. The one who made the universe sleeps in a manger. Here is the imminence and the intimacy of God's nature. That he who is the transcendent God has now become one with man. He is here. He is here with us. Fear not. Let everyone understand that we are not like poor orphans standing at the seashore or standing lost in the airport somewhere, wailing and sobbing and crying after a father who's gone away and who can no longer hear you and it's just left you standing there helpless, lying on a beach, lying on a chair in the middle of the terminal. No, that's not the situation. Let every believer rejoice today and rejoice forevermore that you are traveling through life with your Father, with your Savior, the Savior of your soul, with the life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit. So lift up your heads, lift up your hearts, and fear not. To every man, to every woman, born in weakness, tried and troubled, to every man and woman living for the weekend, to every man and woman covered with sweat and dying too soon and lowered in a box six feet under to become compost, you are not an insignificant creature on a lonely planet. You're not an aphid clinging to this rosebud. You're not a fly on the kitchen wall. For unto us is born this day a child, 
Unto us a son is given. His name is Wonderful and Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you see it? Do you see it now? No longer transcendent only, but imminent and intimate. And here and now is our God. God has come down all the way to a manger. And I would like to climb up all the way to the roof of my house and shout the title of today's message. The God incarnate is the end of fear. The God incarnate is the end of fear. Come on, church. Praise him right where you are. You know how to clap your hands right where you are. Give him some love that the God incarnate is the end of fear. But let me ask you, are you afraid right now? Is there fear in you right now? Maybe you've been separated from God for a long time. Maybe there's something that has kept you separated from your God for a long time. This, what we're talking about today, is pure comfort and joy for anyone who says, I've been gone for too long. I have gone too far. I have been too bad. There's no grace left for me or some similar thought. But you know what? That is not true. That is just not true. Did not Jesus come to seek and save that which was lost? Didn't Jesus leave the 99 and go after the one? Wasn't Jesus born to save? You know, if he does not save, then he was born in vain. If he is not a savior, then he has failed in his mission. And Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. This is the power of the incarnation. This is the joy of Christmas. The God incarnate in Christ is the end of fear. See, fear will always oppose and prevent the truth. The truth is, God is good, and God is great, and through his son, Jesus, you can entirely entrust yourself to him. You can say to him, Lord, do with me in this life whatever you will, whatever you want, and he will never be unkind to you. You can rest in his love, and you can be obedient to his will for your life. And if you do, you will have reached the highest point that any human being can ever reach. Yes. And if you do, you can say the Holy Spirit of God has done a great work in me. And if you do, you shall be fit for heaven already, this very day, come whatever may in this life. Fear opposes this. The devil opposes this. So my brothers and sisters, friends and guests, and everyone listening to the sound of my voice, let us say with the angel today, fear not. Let us receive this great and gladsome good news. And may Christ, who is the hope of glory, may he be formed in you today. And may we sing, may we sing, may we sing over our families, may we sing over our children and our grandchildren, may we sing over the whole world, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are just so amazed and humbled and blessed with the 
additional meaning that, that we can attach to those two simple words that the angel spoke, to fear not. We thank you for all that that entails, that this was such a game-changing moment, that the transcendent God was coming down and coming near. And I pray, Father, for everyone this morning, that we would all just draw near to you, because if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this earth and showing the imminence and the intimacy of our great God. We come to you in faith, and we expect fully, O oh God, to receive your grace in our lives. When we mean business with you, you always mean business with us. So Lord, bless us today. And strengthen us in your grace and in your goodness and in your imminence. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.